Welcome to The Authority File, the podcast where you'll hear conversations with academic librarians, technologists, researchers, and authors whose work is laying the foundation for higher education's future. I'm Bill Mickey, your host and the editorial director at Choice. In this four-part series, which is brought to you with support from Wilfrid Laurier University Press, my guests and I have an extremely fun conversation about research. Now, you might ask, what's so fun about talking about research? That's a good question, so tune into the next four episodes and find out. But I'll give you some hints, starting with our guests. Joining me are Beth Driscoll, Associate Professor of Publishing and Communications at the University of Melbourne, and Claire Squires, Professor of Publishing Studies at the University of Stirling. Claire and Beth are co-authors of a self-published novella called The Frankfurt Kaboof, a comic erotic thriller about the book publishing industry with the Frankfurt Book Fair serving as the setting. Now, out from Wilfrid Laurier University Press as a critical edition, it includes an introduction, annotated text, and 15 contributed essays. The book is actually a research project, the culmination of years of fieldwork that employs a host of artistic and creative approaches aimed at upending traditional scholarly workflows that result, in this case, as an examination of the power dynamics and creative economies of book publishing. But our conversation goes way beyond the book industry, focusing on the intersection of scholarly publishing, creativity, and yes, fun, to explore how a more disruptive approach can result in serious scholarship. In this first episode, we get to meet Claire and Beth and learn about how their book, The Frankfurt Kaboof, came together. Okay, Beth and Claire, welcome to the program. Thanks for having us. Sure. (laughs) So before we get into your book, I'm wondering if uh, if each of you could just provide a little bit of background on your current positions and and research interests. And Claire, why don't we start with you? (laughs) (laughs) This is going to be the challenge throughout, I'm sure. Yeah, right. right. (laughs) I'm a professor of uh, publishing studies um, at the University of Stirling in Scotland, and I also have another role as director of the Scottish Graduate School for Arts and Humanities, which is a cross Scotland role. And as my, yeah, as my title would suggest, I'm, my field is broadly put publishing studies. But for me, that includes, I think, what I'd call book cultures more broadly. So not just what happens at publishers, but things which Beth and I have researched together quite a bit. So book festivals and book fairs, which we're going to talk um, about, obviously, in more detail in a moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And Beth. Uh, Yeah, so I'm an Associate Professor of Publishing and Communications at the University of Melbourne in Australia. And just like Claire, I research contemporary book cultures. So we're both interested in the publishing industry, but also in the way that books circulate more generally. So for me, that's, you know, people who want to publish their own books. How do they go about doing it? How do those books move through the world? How do readers find them? And then what do they do with them once they have them in their lives? Mm. That's excellent. So it, when you say book culture, does that include the, the consumer end of the, the spectrum as well, not just the profession? Yeah. yeah, definitely. So I think that's one of the interesting things about how book book culture is evolving is that there's more uh, blending between professional roles and amateur roles now that more mm. people can get involved. Right. Um, Beth, Beth is probably being modest, but she has a forthcoming book oh, yeah. <laughs> on readers next year, which I will plug for her. Oh, oh thanks, excellent. Claire. Really? Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's called uh, What Readers Do. And the joke is they do a lot more than read. There's, uh, you know, there's a bit more to it than that. Wow. Okay. Well, I'm tempted to follow up on that, but we've got a lot of questions to get through already. So, um, all right. So the, your current book, uh, The Frankfurt Kaboof, um, did you intend to write a novella when you were went to the fair? I mean, I'm, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but um, the Frankfurt Book Fair was sort of the inspiration, I suppose, for this. Um, or did you become inspired while you were at the fair? And, you know, and how did the two of you come together to, to work on this project? It was it was definitely the latter. Um, yeah. Yeah, we did not set out to write a comic erotic thriller set at the Frankfurt <laughs> Book Fair. I'd like to feel I had that mindset, but it just came to us as it went along. We, yeah. What we were doing, though, um, we were at Frankfurt Book Fair. Beth and I um, had already been working together, so we're an established writing and research um, collaborative partnership. But we, we were at the Frankfurt Book Fair doing field work um, for another book which we published earlier, um, the Frankfurt Book Fair 
and bestseller business. So doing field work there. And mm. so the novella arose out of that field work and during that field work as well. Um, Beth, do you want to yeah. talk about when it actually? <laughs> I mean, the Frankfurt Book Fair has a kind of a mythic status. And especially for me coming from Australia, you know, Frankfurt is the other side of the world. It's quite expensive and difficult to get there. Not everyone does, but everyone in publishing has heard of the Frankfurt Book Fair. Right. And so the opportunity to research it with Claire was really exciting. I was like, finally, I'll understand what the Frankfurt Book Fair is all about. And then we landed there day one of our field work and could already tell that it was it was not an easy event to understand. There's so many layers. There's so many different people doing so many different things. And so in the end, Claire and I went back three years running and we tried all sorts of different creative research methods to try and get at the texture and the nuance of the dynamics. Um, you know, this is a big event where people buy and sell rights to books and adapt books and um, take the pulse of the industry. And so there's a lot of kind of subtle exchanges that happened that we were really keen to understand in terms of their importance. So we went to parties, we um, we measured stands, we noticed that some stands were bigger than others and we were curious about that. We did little vox pop interviews and yeah, one night in the middle of the second year of our field work, we started writing this novella. Nice. So the, uh, so the moment you decided that maybe a kind of a semi-fictional approach to this might be the sort of not the easiest but the I guess the most uh, appropriate approach to describing what the fair is all about yeah well, well it kind of started off actually the actual moment of origin was a, a, a bit of a kind of writing tussle so what actually happened was when we were kind of thinking through all of these responses that we'd had reflections that we'd had at the book fair to the things that Beth was just talking about we were writing an abstract for a conference, an academic conference, and um, one of us wrote some copy and the other deemed it to be too exciting for a, a conference paper. <laughs> but rather than, you know, continuing an argument about whether to make it less exciting, what we decided in our, in our typical mode was to, to lean into the excitement and the right. thriller mode and to, to get writing from there. So actually... I think some of that copy from that original conference abstract ended up being the cover copy, actually, from, mm. from the original publication that we had. So that was kind of the moment at which we started off. But I suppose it's that kind of broader question that you're asking about why fiction as yeah. well. Why, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that phrase, too exciting, captures a little bit of, you know, some of what we were noticing was not, it was not dry and academic. It was, you know, that texture of an exciting trade event and there was um you know there was political debates going on there was you know the the sentence that was too exciting was about um police I think patrolling the aisles with guns and batons and there was a little bit of that happening and there, you know there's huh. heightened security presence right. and we were trying to figure out what place does this have at a book fair like this is meant to be the genteel world of ideas right how come there's all of these other undercurrents and um and those were the kinds of things that we worked through using fiction those yeah mm. the things that um you know that, that there's not a ready-made academic vocabulary to explore right and we will uh later in the conversation we will sort of talk about that dynamic between the creative and the and the, and the um scholarly but you know i'm curious just in the moment um did did you did you consider that you know as you were sort of writing this exciting paper, uh, how that might impact its its prospects in getting published? Uh, yeah, um, I think maybe because we were at Frankfurt Book Fair, where it feels like great books are born, we were very confident about uh, there being oh. Yeah. So, you know, we're like, maybe this is it. Maybe this is the book of the fair, the next bestseller. Everyone will be right. clamoring to read our novella about sure. the fair. But we also, I think, wanted to play with, I don't know, publishing online. Through, we published it through Wattpad. Hmm. Um, and, you know, there, there's an air of experimentation at Frankfurt as well that I think we were going hmm. along with. And I think I think that experimentation was also kind of imp a really important part of the process for us. So yep. when we... Uh, when we originally wrote and published it, we did it serially. So as Beth said, we did it on Wattpad, which is, you know, 
massive self-publishing platform, which we talk about in our classes, you know, written about elsewhere, but we hadn't published ourselves on Wattpad. Hmm. And then we took the next stage to self-publish um, as print copies and e-copies to make it available through Ingram Spark before moving to the, the version that we have today, which is with um, Wilfrid Laurier University Press. And um, kind of going through that process was also really important for us, but the kind of that experimentation with self-publishing was, you know, we, we in some ways we didn't have to think about that at the first stage because we took the decision to self-publish, whether anyone right. publish us or not. Yes. Yeah. And this is all getting kind of made up, but I mean, I guess that's part of the part of the research, I suppose. I mean, you could kind of count it in there. I, I should say as well that, um, you know, on the plane over from Australia to Frankfurt, you know how you have plane thoughts when you're in that kind of yeah. um, suspended animation state? And <laughs> I was just dreaming on the plane and I thought that a portmanteau of my name and Claire's name would be Blair Squiskel, which just struck us both, I think, as a really exciting <laughs> name and something that you could play with. And so then when we had the exciting sentence and then we had a, the name of someone who sounded like they would write exciting books. It just kind of seemed to come together into this idea of the thriller, you know, with the, the right, the right, slightly ridiculous but exciting author name and the concept. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as you mentioned, Claire, the book is is described as a comic erotic thriller about about the book publishing industry, um, and you know, obviously, the Frankfurt Book Fair is at the center of the setting. Um, I'm wondering if you could. And we've just talked a little bit about this already, but a little more parsing of the scholarly from the fiction of the book for us. I mean, how did you or how do you think a novella format can can influence or impact scholarly writing and research? Yeah, it's it's such an interesting question, I think. And I, I think um, when we were thinking, I suppose, about the origins of, of this current book, so the critical edition, one of the things that we really wanted to think through is, is what this novella did mm -hmm. um, for um, a scholarly environment, but at the same time potentially be something that people could read outside of academia. You know, it's, it's a thriller plot, it's racy, it's short. Um, so in, in the introduction to um, the critical edition, we, we work through quite a lot of what, what it is that, that fiction can bring to scholarship so you know there's obviously lots of conversation about what fiction can do more broadly in terms of you know giving us insight into other worlds um in all sorts of in all sorts of positive and negative worlds ne negative ways but i think it was really thinking with all of these observations and reflections that we had what might be the limits of what we could write even in a book that wasn't entirely normal that we'd already re were writing about the frankfurt book fair and to, to play with other ideas. So it was mm. kind of really, really thinking through the, the possibilities of fiction within within that scholarly environment. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. And there's something about fiction that, because it creates that richly imaginative space where everything's a bit amplified, especially if you're writing a comic erotic thriller, it really lets some of our um, observations and maybe even our frustrations with the publishing industry and academia bubble to the surface. So, for example, our, our heroine is Beatrice Deft, a disillusioned high school teacher who finds herself in the middle of things at Frankfurt. But she has flashbacks to scenes back in Melbourne with her ex-boyfriend, who's a publisher of poetry uh, and really very much does not believe in diversity and inclusion. He, quote, only sees excellence. And wow. I think um, being able for us to to articulate what it was that we find problematic about that position through the vehicle of fiction was very useful. Yeah, and I imagine um, writing it in a, in a fictional format um, causes the reader to pay even more, clo you know, pay attention even more closely to thinking about, um, you know, it, because it's sort of centered in a scholarly, I guess, um, context that y you think about the scholarly part of it even more as, than you would reading a straight up paper, I guess, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's kind of both more surprising, but then also it lets you, you know, the goodies in this book are really good and the baddies are really mm. bad. So it's a bit more extreme, which lets you kind of play with your sense of right and wrong and, un, you know, understand what it is that you do believe and where you do think change needs to happen. Uh, so it's it's yeah, just a very I mean, different. It, mm. Yeah, and I was about to say, you know, the, 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 the struggle that's contained within the Frankfurt Kabuff is about 
freedom of speech and the kind of rhetoric that you get kind of more more generally, but very much at the Frankfurt Book Fair, you know, they, they champion freedom of speech. And yet there's all sorts of contestations about who might be the guest of honor in any particular year, China, for example. Um, and, um, you know, one of those observations that we had, and we were finding it quite hard to, to process and deal with when we're at the Frankfurt Book Fair is that they had German neo-Nazi organizations that were publishers that had stands legitimately at the Frankfurt Book Fair. And I think it was the first year that we were there. Fights literally b- f- happened on, on those yeah. stands. I mean, it's why know, the police hugely, were there. Yeah. Yeah, ab- absolutely. So thinking, wow. well, how, how do we how do we do this? And there's obviously lots of, of, of work in, in the kind of general media, the publishing trade media, academia that will address this. But I suppose our, our response in terms of that, that plot line, um, not to give too many spoilers, but if you have a <laughs> vice president for the, the freedom of speech, um, you know, what's what's their role? And what does that mean when you've then got some neo-Nazis at the book fair? And so that kind of, as Beth said, that real intensification of those roles really kind of allow you to play with satirize for sure um, mm-hmm. some of those attitudes but then hopefully really make people think what what's going on here what are the dynamics here how might we want to make interventions as well and i guess this this was our intervention in that that particular debate yeah excellent um so you mentioned the critical edition um which is what's available now and and, and i'm wondering sort of how that evolved so you you wrote the novella at and following the fair then how did that evolve into the critical edition or was that the goal all along claire and i did a deep dive into um the archives of Alapulism, which is the uh, the term we use for our conceptual work together, which meant me going through our meeting notes and Claire going through our Facebook messages, both trying to find the first mention of the critical edition and our hopes for its realisation. And it was pretty early on we found out, like definitely while we were still writing the novella. So mm. the way we wrote that was, um, you know, we left Frankfurt and we were just writing back and forth in Google Docs as as one of us would get half an hour and a burst of inspiration, we'd go for it and then the next would pick up where we'd left off. Mm-hmm. And and then we'd kind of be messaging each other like, oh, you know, I've done a bit more on Chapter 6, over to you now. And somehow in that messaging we started saying, wouldn't it be great if we wrote critically at the same time as we were writing creatively and, and fused those two modes? Excellent. You just heard from Beth Driscoll, Associate Professor of Publishing and Communications at the University of Melbourne, and Claire Squires, Professor of Publishing Studies at the University of Stirling. Beth and Claire are co-authors of a novella called The Frankfurt Kabuff. This series is brought to you with support from Wilfrid Laurier University Press. Join us next week when we discuss how creative disruption can advance certain aspects of scholarly publishing. As always, underwriting opportunities for the Authority File podcast are directed by Choices Advertising Manager Pam Marino, and all of our episodes are produced and edited by Choices Digital Media Producer Sabrina Kofer, with support from Digital Media Assistant Ashley Roy. That's all for this week. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>